Hey everyone, my name is Joe Barnard, and what you just saw was the second flight test of the upper stage for the 148th scale model of the Falcon Heavy that I'm building. This model has four flight computers, it has four thrust vectoring systems, it has a ton of fire involved, and it's really complicated. So in order to make sure we can get it right on the first all-up launch, we want to test all of these systems in isolated segments like this. So without further ado, let's take a look at how the flight went. I have a whole plot here with all of the flight data and we're going to go through this section by section. To start off, let's talk about the biggest differences between the two different test flights of this vehicle here, and that is stability. Between the first test launch and the second test launch, I changed a few things. The first of which is the PID update rate, or the refresh rate. This is the rate, usually in hertz or cycles per second, that the flight computer sends commands down to the thrust vectoring mount to change its position. Previously, the PID refresh rate in the flight computer was 13.33 hertz, but in this most recent test, I jacked that up to about 25 hertz. Finding the correct PID refresh rate for a rocket is a bit of a tricky task. You don't want to go too low because your rocket won't fly well, and you don't want to go too high because your rocket also won't fly well. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this, all of this information will be coming out in an episode of Landing Model Rockets pretty soon, um, so stay tuned, make sure you're subscribed. The second thing that I changed from Test Flight 1 to Test Flight 2 was that I just increased the PID gains, which means the rocket was more sensitive to changes in orientation, and when the orientation changed, it would try to correct in a more strong way. One of the biggest changes that I made here was increasing something called the I-term in the PID controller. Now the I-term deals with error over time. So say you have a small misalignment in your thrust vectoring mount off the pad, right? You know, things are not completely straight up and down, so you're not firing the motor through the center of mass. The I-term is going to look at that misalignment and then try to add to it and make sure that we can bring that motor back to center, but it happens slowly over time. Again, if you're interested in learning more about this, make sure you're subscribed. We'll be talking about it in more detail pretty soon. Moving on, after the main motor burned out, the vehicle coasted up to an apogee of just under 35 meters. Now the parachutes were set to deploy at 35 meters, but the vehicle didn't reach all the way up there. And that's actually fine because the signal flight computer is configured to deploy chutes at or under the altitude you set. So if you don't reach your expected apogee and you set your flight computer to deploy your chutes at apogee, they'll still deploy. And that's exactly what happened here. So as soon as the computer detects apogee and detects that we're falling, it deploys those parachutes. However, they do not actually deploy because this is where our problems begin. What you may have noticed is that the fairing doesn't fully deploy. It doesn't fully separate apart. And in order to understand why this happens, we have to look at the design. The fairing that I've designed basically exists in four separate parts. So there's the base of the fairing. There are the two sides. These are the two sides that encapsulate the parachute. And then there's the nose cone or just the top section. These pieces all slide together to form the correct shape of the Falcon Heavy fairing. So long as they're under pressure from the tightly packed parachutes that are inside, they won't separate very easily. But as soon as you deploy a couple of explosive charges in the base of the fairing, the whole thing should pop apart. If you watched the last episode of Landing Model Rockets, this is kind of a no fault tolerant system. Any one piece of the fairing sliding out should initiate a total failure of the structure of the fairing, and that's really what we want. Earlier this summer, I conducted several fairing separation tests. The first one failed because I simply didn't include enough black powder in my explosive charge. The second one succeeded, and it did really well. What you'll notice here is that the top part slides off first, which then allows the sides to fold out under that high pressure of the packed parachute. The whole system basically just falls apart at that point. This is the type of successful deployment that I expected with this test, but there's a really good reason why it didn't happen. Let's take a closer look at the two fairing halves here. So this is one of them, and what you'll notice on the profile is that one edge is just straight up and down on this little lip here, and the other one is sort of chamfered. It has this slant to it. And the reason that you want this slant here is that when the two fairing halves are together like this, you want them to be able to separate out cleanly without interfering with the circle that might still be here. This is, this is, we're assuming that the base of the fairing is right here. So you can't expand this circle because it's just rigid and plastic. You have to let these fairings sort of contract and get closer to each other at the bottom. That's why you need this hinge, right? So what happens if you try to do the same thing with the straight edge? Well, the circle expands. So the diameter of the bottom half of this lip is going to expand, and that's a problem if this piece, which is where this would be connected, uh, doesn't expand. So this is it. This is why the fairing didn't fully separate. What happened was the nose cone of the fairing was on top of these two, and the whole assembly came off the top when the pyrocharge is deployed. Now, of course, this is, it's quite broken here, but <laughs> essentially what happened is that these two fairing halves tried to separate. They tried to come out, 
and they couldn't do it very well because they were confined by this top nose cone, which didn't pop off. Um, and if you're wondering, man, who made this really bad engineering decision to only include relief chamfers on the bottom and not on the top? It's me, I did this. So you might be thinking to yourself, Joe, why would you include relief chamfers in the bottom of your two fairing halves and not in the top? What a great question. The answer is that people just make mistakes sometimes. Like this is just a dumb engineering mistake. This is something that really should have been avoided and really shouldn't have happened in the first place. But I am a one person team and these things just crop up every now and then. Um, a good way to avoid this is I just should have tested the fairing separation more. I should have been more thorough with my test campaign on making sure that the fairing could clearly separate and deploy those shoots every time. And so now that we know why the fairing didn't fully separate and why the shoots didn't deploy, let's move on to the last phase of flight, which is the descent. And it's a rather fast one at that. So after the fairing charges fire, the rocket continued to fall, picking up more and more speed as it went, eventually impacting the ground at 100 kilometers per hour or 60 miles per hour. Either one, its metric is still better, but whatever. It's really too bad that it hit the ground so hard because it destroyed most of the fairing. I mean, it certainly made a dent here. You can't see, but the U-bolt that holds the parachutes, that's all sunken in there too. It also killed one of my onboard cameras and then just like turned off the other one. But all of these things just pale in comparison to what is certainly the most tragic result of this flight. It's really, uh, something that upsets me, and it's that because the fairing didn't deploy, we didn't get to see the red sports car float down from the second stage of the Falcon Heavy. So next time, next time we fly it, it'll come out for sure. So as for serious next steps, I'm gonna be redesigning the fairings so that it can safely separate every time. And of course, I'm gonna run a second series of fairing separation tests on the ground to verify that. I might run it in a few different positions and orientations, and we're gonna do you know, several tests of each design to make sure it can really you know, go the distance. I'm also probably gonna to need to rebuild the second stage entirely. Even though the, uh, the thrust vectoring mount here is totally intact, the bottom of the rocket is crunched pretty good, and it could just use a new coat of paint and I don't know, these are really easy to build. So I'll probably just refabricate the whole thing. And finally, I'm gonna do my best to repair the cameras that were on the rocket when it hit the ground. Those impact speeds of 100 kilometers per hour instantly killed one of the cameras. And the other one is having a lot of trouble turning back on. So like cross your fingers, maybe we can make it work. Um, like all of the video footage is corrupt, it's all gone. Um, so it's really a bummer because they were brand new cameras. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video or any of the other video series and you're interested in supporting BPS, a great way to do it is through the Patreon that's linked in the description down below. All of the funds that come in through donations or pledges on Patreon go directly toward funding things like replacing cameras and repairing rockets, and most importantly, funding the development of much larger and more complicated rockets. So if you're interested, the link is down there. And if you're not, totally okay. My name is Joe Barnard. Thank you very much for watching. May your skies be blue and your wind be low.